The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Hi, everyone. We will we will start in a few minutes. Um, can any, can everyone hear me? I guess. So we will wait a few minutes to see to allow people to uh, enroll in our webinar, and then uh, we will proceed. <laughs> okay. Uh, because we only have yeah, 13, so more are, com more are coming. Yeah. Meanwhile, um, after after the our presentation in this webinar, you can all you can all uh, pose some questions. If you see your screen bottom right, you have a chat where you can uh, send us your questions. And of course, Professor Jean Martins will answer all your doubts and comments. So wait in just a few more minutes, and then we will start. So, welcome to our webinar. My name is Katerina. I work for Modern Park, which is actually a science and technology park um, nearby the University, Faculty of Science and Technology of the Nova University of Lisbon. We are one of the partners from the consortium of the project Internet of Energy, Education and Qualification. And this is our first webinar. Thank you for joining. So just to give you a heads up on our project. So the main objectives of the project are qualifying new professional professionals and also support them in any uh, digital transformation for their UA companies in the field. Uh, raising awareness, of course, about uh, the IOE technologies and applications and their potential, technical potential. And in the end, the project will uh, create four online courses available for everyone who wants to participate. Um, the course will include VET qualifications for professionals, staff from companies, namely SMEs or bigger ones, uh, university students and other stakeholders or other people that really are interested in participating in the project. I will show you my presentation. Just a little, hmm, wait. Can everyone see my screen? <laughs> Just wait. Uh, so our webinar today uh, is related to nearly zero energy building and energy flexibility. It will be held by Professor Jean Martiz from the Faculty of Science and Technology, uh, namely the Department of Electri Electrical and Computing Engineer. And uh, now I will pass the the word to Professor João. Thank you and enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is João Martins, a professor in the Department of in the Computer Engineering and the of and technology of Nova University of Lisbon. And um, I will speak a little bit about the uh, um, so change here. That, just one moment. Now, okay, so I will to you uh, about um, and energy flexibility. <laughs> okay, so the outline of this presentation uh, will be the list description of the new energy concept. I will speak a little bit about of the end integration into the grid. Uh, what can we do with end communities and energetic communities? Uh, how can we use the end 
cumulative concept on a limited way and use it that energetic flexibility. Okay, for the to set the scene, uh, ourselves be aware that 40% of final energy consumption in Europe comes from buildings. All buildings are responsible for 6% of gas, uh, gas emissions. Uh, we have in Europe 35% of buildings over 50 years old, which means uh, uh, 75% energetically and so here a uh, serious problem that we have to work on. Taking that into consideration, the uh, European Union has uh, and, and issues for direct, uh, namely the energy performance of the directive uh, in 2010 and then updated in 2018. Uh, so this directive uh, specifically mentioned that uh, buildings should become uh, zero emissions December 31 of next year, and all new buildings should have been also until uh, December 31 of 2018. Um, well, this has not been achieved uh, in total, uh, and now we will direct idea of all the buildings in Europe to be uh, zero gas gas until 2015. So what exactly is a near zero energy building? Well, basically, a uh, definition that we can use, but it, it is think that during a certain period of time, which is typically here, it produces the same amount of energy consumes. So in this over a year, uh, we can say that we are near zero because we consume the same amount of energy it is produced, but this production and this is has to be uh, near the building. So we are in the new energy production near the site where the building is located. How can we achieve a uh, energy building condition? So if you see here on the, on the right hand side, uh, there is the concern of the building over here, and there is all solar production of energy. Uh, you can see that areas beneath both, uh, both areas are the same, or more or less the same, uh, which means that are actually a status that be considered as a um, near uh, condition. Uh, it means that uh, we are actually producing consuming uh, the same. But if you look on the left hand side, then the way to the NZ building. Assume that uh, you are at the building with a mode and use an efficient measure uh, to decrease the amount of energy that the building needs without uh, um, making any trouble, any uh, change of comfort for the users. So in this sense, energy will reduce until a certain point where you cannot reduce anymore because at least a little amount of energy for the building to operate. In this, uh, in this time, in this step is where the, the renewable energy comes into action. So at this point, um, you increase the amount of energy produces on in order to achieve that full degree line that you have on your left hand uh, graphic, which uh, depicts the position of a near zero building. Of course, we are talking about a uh, building that is uh, good for, for, for the environment, is good for, for the use, uh, is even good for the electric. But we have to take into account the uh, problem of that so, and we have to be very careful when we are changing building to the NCF condition. Uh, I will show you the, the results from um, a study that we made that is published on the paper that you can see in the bottom right. Um, with data, real data, taken from the Portuguese city of Evra, which is an UNESCO site. Uh, on the year 2014, 
15, uh, consider a number of 19 buildings. Uh, if you see on your right hand side, uh, you can see the power consumption of these 19 buildings from the power transformer of the grid that is supplying these 19 buildings. Okay, you can uh, clearly see that you have uh, more power on winter uh, in the heats of, uh, of our winter and during the summer we have uh, less power. On the right uh, left hand side, uh, you can see the load diagram of the power in the transformer. So what we can see is that we have less load in the morning until six o'clock, then the load starts to increase, and of course we have higher load of uh, people getting home around uh, seven o'clock p.m. Now, what happens if all of these 19 buildings that were not considered to be MZ started to become MZ? So what we did is to uh, replace each of the building by air condition, meaning we installed or required uh, installation of a PV panel on each building in order for this building to achieve the MZ condition. So on the right hand side, you see the change load diagram that will occur as long as we are increasing the number of buildings that are achieving the end state. So we start with the, uh, the diagram on the left, and if you see around the huge increase of power uh, as long as we are increasing the number of buildings. Why this increase? Because at noon we have less load on the buildings and we are producing energy coming from the panels. So basically, it's renewable energy. But look uh, that, uh, particularly, we have the 19 buildings uh, achieve the rated power of the transformer. Of course, on reverse energy, because we are in not consuming, but the transformer will be uh, exposed to a power that is rated power. Now, why, why does this happen? This is because there is a change of load, if you see on the right hand graphic, change of load that was typically in the end of the day to a load that now is concentrated on around noon. Of course, the load now, as I, I told before, reverse, but nevertheless, it stress the transformer. We were using uh, the IC6076.7, which is the standard uh, for um, of uh, electrical transformer. So it's the electrotechnic standard to uh, evaluate how a load can um, distress the transformer aging. So using these uh, that we have here that are uh, depicted on the standard, we can compute the annual aging of the transformer. So if you look on your uh, left uh, side, what you see is the, um, the have two things there. So you, you temperature of the transformer and you have uh, a line that uh, tells us how many days transformer ages during the year. So on the baseline scenario, and remember the baseline scenario, we did not have any entire buildings. This transformer on this with 19 buildings will age eight years, uh, eight years during all all one here, but if uh, we consider that we all buildings on an end condition, and look at your right hand side, the temperature of the transformer increases a lot, and uh, after one year, we have almost 2,040 years of 2,400. Sorry, of uh, of the transformer. So this uh, is something that usually people do not consider, but actually what we are doing is to inject energy on a reverse way into the grid 
and we are exposing the transformer to a higher load that he was not foreseen to have. So he will age away a lot faster than was uh, expected. In this we can or we should mitigate this problem. To mitigate this problem, there are typical three solutions. Or we can install energy storage systems, and this system will absorb the excess of energy that is injected into the grid, particularly uh, around noon. We can the energy supply, do some curtailment on the PV panels, and of course, this is not a solution because we are wasting energy that can be used, or we can use the concept of energy flexibility. Before going into the concept of energy flexibility, let me show you uh, some examples uh, that are uh, going also to be published on the Ethical Power System Research Magazine um, about a system that can be used to mitigate this problem. So this system uh, was tested on a building, which actually is the building of our uh, where uh, there are some PV panels that the building into an inception, and we also consider the possibility of having a storage system installed. So, what uh, this uh, system will do is basically it will increase the amount of energy stored on the if it is foreseen that a lot of energy is going to be injected into the grid, then stress or transformer or if the battery system is already full, then we'll do curtailment in order to supply, uh, to, to, to diminish the, the load on the transport. On the left hand side, uh, you can see the temperature of the transformer. We don't have any power PV production, uh, so the transformer is not stressed, and during one year, the transformer will age approximately three days of equivalent days of aging. So no problem whatsoever. However, when we uh, consider the installation panels, the temperature of the transformer rise, as you can see on the left hand side, and if you look to the equivalent of aging on the right hand side, we achieve a thousand days of equivalent agent, which of course is completely unsustainable. However, if we apply the, the system that we designed uh, to the aging of the transformer, you can see on the left hand side that the temperature of the transformer will stay below its point, and on the right hand side, uh, the diagram will also be below one point rated of even below one, uh, and one rated power. Uh, and meaning that will not work. And if you look here on the left hand side, you see that the aging of the transformer below uh, 65 days, uh, around 10 days. So it means that during one year, the transformer will actually will age the of one year. Of course, this is a cost, there is a cost associated. And there is this Pareto front on the um, uh, side of your presentation, uh, where you can see that if we don't have any uh, storage at all, uh, we will curtail 1,000 kilowatt hour energy for a year. Or in the other uh, opposite side, uh, if we have a huge battery system, rather not to curtail any energy, then have a 250 kilowatt hour battery system to absorb all excess of energy. The other way to turn around is before the use of energy flexibility. So energy flexibility can be defined in a way where the building is consumption and taking into account local climate conditions the occupant, and this is very important, occupant should be always in the center, and requirement of the grid. You can have what we call implicit flexibility or explicit flexibility, where using implicit flexibility, you are 
actually changing, for instance, tariffs or using some demand side management penalty conditions so that the load of the building uh, is changed to this condition. The other way is to use flexibility in an explicit way where you can, in advance, know was what is the flexibility of the building and how can you use it. And, uh, for this, you can use storage, generation, or you can even change uh, change the loads. Um, there is also some description of these services in this paper that on the International Journal of Power and Energy Systems. Furthermore, you cannot think only of a building. But you should think of a community of, and in this case, of cooperative community of NZEB buildings. What are the advantages of considerability with a, a lot of buildings and not only one building? Okay, a lot of buildings profile so, so you can combine them there is a huge number of controlled equipment so we can consider more equipment than just two or three per per house um, and there's a great potential for the energy available because it's a, a, a huge a bigger amount of pg energy that is available and also although we are talking about this today uh, some new business models this, you can even read more on this paper published on energy magazine. But let's see exactly what am I uh, am I saying here. Look on the left hand side where you have a building, building with load and a PV uh, production. And see the PV production does not cover load because there are some areas where you have PV production and you do not have load. But if you the load on this building, meaning that you can change using the, the, the time of day where you can load, then uh, the load can be moved into the solar panel in order to use as much as possible the energy can from the PV, PV panel. And then you achieve uh, a better condition. But now, look, if you don't have only one building, but we have, for instance, community of five on the left hand side and there is a huge gap between uh, difference between the load and the consumption but on the right hand side after optimizing all the load you have a usage of the coming from the pv and please note that what you have here on the right hand side is a better use than what here when you have all building. So this is a very simple example to show that you can have many results using the energy from the your systems and projecting into the grid if you have a community rather than only one building. And this is a, this has been recognized by the European Commission and uh, the European Commission already has issued some directive where uh, the framework for energy communities is already considered. In, in Portugal, where we are now, uh, this energy communities framework is established from a legal point of view. How can we uh, use uh, this uh, flexibility and aggregate uh, flexibility? So, like I told you before, if we consider a set of buildings, a community, we can use the flexibility and using only one building. And uh, equipment can be used, the house equipment that can be used to achieve uh, this uh, usage can be uh, somehow uh, divided into three categories, uh, with or without energy storage or with energy production. Um, and if you consider energy storage, uh, you have to consider that you can never do or stochastic field behavior, where the electrical vehicles have energy storage, but we never know when that they are connected or not. And if you do not have energy storage, you have to consider that some have shifting capability and others do not do not have those shifting capabilities. Uh, to the ones that have shifting capabilities, we have the washing machines, dryers, um, dishwashers, uh, whatever. Uh, and 
are those that I like to consider that they are they are this shifting capabilities. Let me just now uh, address uh, some uh, issues that are very important to use this energy flexibility. First, uh, you have to consider uh, several innovative technological issues. For instance, smart metering, energy production and storage, uh, power measurement, and equipment facility. All of these are, if you are familiar with the smart grid architecture model, which is on the left-hand side of your uh, of your, are uh, on the most part uh, low list, of course, on the lowest part of uh, this this model covering the the computer process and the component uh, the component layer. Um, we were involved uh, in this project called uh, Novo Grid, uh, where a lot of these solutions were tested, particularly the solutions related the, with smart metering. The, this smart metering uh, is very because uh, the concept uh, should be used in order to better control the rules on your homes, the concept of the unbundled smart meter. The unbundled smart meter is a smart meter uh, that has an part called smart meter extension, open part, which is basically this machine, uh, uh, part of the meter deployed third party service. So this means that you can use this type of meters, and at the same time that you are measuring the energy you are consuming, you can at the same time uh, control your equipment in use their flexibility. Uh, these smart meters, smart meters are also very good solution uh, because they can be connected to what we call energy. The energy meter is power electronic device that is being designed to be installed in each building and it will connect the PV panels to the storage systems to the grid and to the house but furthermore this uh, energy router uh, which the picture you can see on the top uh, right of your screen the this energy router can manage the power flow coming from the, um, the PV panels or from the grid into the energy storage or to the house itself. So we think that all the solutions that we mentioned before, uh, uh, deviating the energy from the, the PV production, storing it, uh, or even control the, the equipment by the uh, SMC, so smart uh, meter extension, can be all together in one, uh, combined all together in one equipment. One thing very important that the energy is uh, performing or can perform uh, is what we call local load, load balancing. This local load balancing um, is uh, designed in a way that will solve a lot of problems on the uh, low voltage grid. Uh, because low voltage grid, all the loads are not balanced, so you, you have some phases with higher load than on the others, and the energy router what is doing is to inject more power on the loads that are uh, higher demanding, meaning that from the grid point of view, your building will become as a balanced load. So if you consider that all buildings on the uh, NZEP community uh, can be equipped with an energy router, then the whole community from Agreed point of view from the DSO point of view can be seen as a perfectly balanced uh, load. This concept can be even extended uh, into a microgrid uh, where, as you can see here, um, you can compensate the freezing of the voltage on the radial grid with the introduction of PV or with the introduction of the router, this, uh, um, this fault is not only compensated, also balanced. To finish the, my presentation, I'd like just to show you a very uh, simple example uh, how we can also use a storage in order to improve uh, the conditions of the storage. Please remember, 
always speaking of near zero energy equipped with a panel in order to make on equipped uh, with energy storage to uh, compensate excess of energy that you can have during some time of the day. And here, uh, you can see a set of where we have positive functions. One basically uh, to decrease the grid direct. So the idea is to the load or the energy storage or to uh, have the load exactly the same as the production. So in the sense that we uh, decrease as much as possible the grid interaction. The second uh, objective function is, but it is uh, multiplied by the price of energy. So basically the first one takes into account only the minimization of the grid interaction. The second one takes into account the minimization of the cost of the energy you are paying to. And you can see what you can see here is that indicators that uh, I mentioned before, which are uh, self-consumption, self-sufficiency. So self-consumption basically uh, establish the amount uh, of energy that you consume yourself from the PV panels and self-sufficiency, the amount of energy that you do not need to take uh, from the grid. And uh, if you compute uh, both solutions, uh, the one that takes into account the uh, interaction and the other one that takes into account also the price, uh, what we see is that the indicator better uh, you take into account only the energy issues. Minimizing the losses, you are minimizing energy in the interaction um, and you are not talking about the price. So if you equal price of energy, uh, then the performance on the grid will definitely be not as good as it would not be considered. In order to finish the presentation, I would like to recall that the flexibility uses in energy systems uh, will be better if it will be approached in a holistic and integrated way. So we have to consider uh, new equipment such as unbundled smart meter or energy route in order to control on the on the building to uh, make the routing of energy between PV storage systems and buildings itself. And please remind that if you have a community of buildings, you will have a, a much better uses of all these energy uh, rather than to have one single building. Okay, this is concluded the presentation. Thank you very much, and I am available for any questions that you may have. Uh, so, guys, thank you for participating and for listening. So now I can ask a question. You have like a lecture here. This is questions, so you can write them, and the professor will answer. Não, pode pode responder a falar. Aqui. Yeah. So, no one has questions? So everyone understood everything perfectly? <laughs> nice. <laughs> How? Okay. Uh, Professor, are you receiving any questions? Okay. So. No? Okay, so if no one has any questions, wait, there's one. I see here a question regarding the current of the market. 
exactly what market you are mentioned, but I can answer on the those ways. First, let's look on the the regarding the interaction between the DSO and the and the buildings or or, or the the community. So uh, one process model that we are now start with the local DSO is to use the flexibility um, of the buildings. Uh, in order to help the grid, so meaning that uh, if the grid uh, is stressed by, let's say, uh, uh, in production, for instance, and then you need to load, uh, then, uh, then because loads are uh, controlled, uh, you can shift to grids where there's not such stress on the grid. This has a price. But, uh, the energy changes and uh, the DSO must pay uh, this different uh, price of energy between the time that the user or the community usually uh, connect the load, the times that the is asking them to, to switch them. I don't know if the question is like this, but this is uh, one interesting issue that has to be addressed between the DSOs and the community. Ah, okay, uh, we have the NZ uh, on the market uh, question, uh, which is how many NZs do you have on the market? Okay, not on the market. We cannot speak of NZ of the market. There are uh, several buildings uh, all over the world um, that are considered and uh, we have also some several in Portugal uh, because the, the issue is if you have a PV production that can cover in, in your building, your perception that can be an NZ. Um, of course, it's better if it's also energy efficient, but that is the, the cost. However, what is still missing is to aggregate communities. So you still have several NZ dispersed uh, in many countries in Europe and the States and even Australia. Um, but to aggregate that community, that is uh, going. Uh, we have um, several projects running at least two uh, European projects uh, where the concept of positive energy district is uh, being developed. Uh, and in this positive energy district, what you have is a step and steps in one district combined all together as an energy unity and acting as, uh, as one. Okay, uh, Flavio, I think this question also for me. Uh, you can keep uh, keep in touch with us. Um, we are deploying this European project I mentioned in Evora, in Portugal, uh, and also in the city of Portland, uh, this kind of uh, positive energy districts. The project started uh, two months ago, so a five year project. Uh, so uh, later, in one or two, we expect to have some very interesting results regarding this positive energy district. Uh, okay, thank you, Fabio. Uh, if anyone has any questions. Please be free to close them. Um, I will share my screen. Can you see? Can you see? Uh, uh, can you see? Changing the organizers. Show my screen. Yes. Um, as you can see, you can follow us. You can follow the project on Facebook. We have a, a Facebook group. We also have a LinkedIn group. We will share everything within our YouTube page. And of course, and we, you can also visit it uh, our official website, project website, and there is uh, also 
section for questions and answerings, and we will more than glad to provide you all the information regarding the project and regarding our webinars, because all webinars will also be uploaded to the website, so feel free to visit us and connect. Okay, so if this is all, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. I could see some colleagues from part from partners from the project here. Thank you for being uh, present and um, have a nice day. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.